Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be ecological disturbance and succession. So let, as always, let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, there are two things I need you to know or be able to do. The first one, explain why some disturbance in an ecosystem is a good thing. And the second is to compare and contrast primary and secondary succession. So that's what we got. Let's go ahead and start getting there. First thing I want to talk about is this idea of equilibrium. Uh, back in the early 1900s, scientists were working on the idea of ecosystems and whether ecosystems were stable or whether their composition changed over time. And in the early 1900s, scientists worked under the basic belief that most ecosystems were stable over time. They recognized that, yes, occasionally there's a fire or a storm or human disturbance, but they thought that, for the most part, most um, ecosystems worked as a giant superorganism or because there were common abiotic characteristics, similar species tended to live together, but they thought that ecosystems did not change very much over time. Now, as research continued, scientists began to realize that most ecosystems are actually in a non-equilibrium state most of the time. They are usually in the process of recovering from some sort of disturbance or there is some process of succession going on. Um, disturbance is defined as anything that changes up the diversity makeup of an ecosystem. So it changes basically the structure of organisms found in the area. And like I said, to kind of repeat myself, scientists realize that most ecosystems are in a non-equilibrium state most of the time. Now this brings me to the idea of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. As scientists have studied this idea of disturbance in ecosystem, they have realized that <clears throat> ecosystems are healthiest if they have some sort of disturbance periodically. If there is too frequent of disturbance, then the ecosystem will not show good species diversity. And if there is too little disturbance, it will not show good species diversity. Now, the reason for that is as follows. If there is too little disturbance in an ecosystem, then some species are able to outcompete other species. So this would be the example of weeds. If you don't have shakeup in an area, weedy species may outcompete other like trees and shrubs and things that would normally grow there. So they need to be taken out periodically. So low disturbance, some species outcompete others. If there is high levels of disturbance, then the ecosystem is being wiped out frequently and slow growing species don't have a chance to recolonize, recolonize an area before the next disturbance. So because of those two factors, a periodic disturbance um, promotes the best diversity in an ecosystem. Now, moving on, um, there are some ecosystems that you need to recognize um, require a large disturbance in order to, I guess, be healthy. Two examples of this is there are some forests, particularly those around Yellowstone National Park, um, that need a good burning every now and then in order to be healthy. Some tree species, their cones will only release seeds when uh, exposed to intense heat. And basically what you get is fire sweeps through, these cones blow open and release their seeds, and then those seeds are able to germinate in soil that has just been rejuvenated from all of the burning trees. Grasslands work under a simple, similar principle. Um, when a grassland burns, a lot of seeds are released, and those seeds are able to use the nutrients that have just been released into the soil in order to get going. So I want you to associate some types of forest and grasslands with the need for a large-scale fire every now and then in order for that ecosystem to be healthy. Now, when ecosystems burn or a storm takes them out or a flood takes them out, or something like that, we get something called ecological succession. And basically, ecological succession is just the order of species returning to that area. So it's kind of like the idea that first some lichens and mosses grow, then you get some grasses, then you get small shrubs, then you get soft trees, then hard trees. Um, and it's, it's just basically the order of going from nothing living in an area to a fully stable climax community. And there's two types of ecological succession primary, secondary. I'm going to go over each of those and then we're going to be done for the day. So primary succession. This is where you have to start from scratch. It's starting out with no soil present at all. Good examples of places where primary succession happen would be like 
a newly formed volcanic island that has just risen out of the sea, or a place where a glacier is re retreating and has scoured all life and vegetation and soil away from the area. In primary succession, the first step is to actually form soil, and that comes from rocks being weathered into sediment, and the first uh, organic life coming there dies, decomposes, and becomes part of that mix. Good soil is a mix of organic and inorganic matter, so it takes quite a long time for a good layer of soil to build up, and not until there is soil in an area can organisms start living there. So the first long period of time in primary succession is actually spent building, those, building the soil, and then as the soil builds, species can come in and start colonizing in a predictable pattern for an area. Now obviously the succession pattern is going to be different for each ecosystem, but it will follow a general pattern of like lichens, mosses, and small organisms to like secondary, like grasses, things like that, and then shrubs and then trees and so on and so forth. Now, you can compare primary succession to secondary succession, and the only real difference is that secondary succession starts out with soil already present, and then the species can just build on top of that. So Places where secondary succession might happen might be a farm that was cleared off and then abandoned. It can be a construction site. It could be a place like a forest that was just clear cut. Anywhere where all the vegetation was taken away, but the soil was left behind. And then, you know, once that succession process starts, it's going to be the same as primary succession, where you're going to go from usually lichens and mosses are first, and then you got herbaceous things like grasses, and then you got shrubs, and then small trees and large trees, and basically. One species either facilitates or inhibits the arrival of another species. So, for example, you get the grasses. Next after the grasses, you might get bushes and shrubs. And as those bushes and shrubs grow, they shade the land where the grass is growing and the grass is no longer able to grow. And then after them, you might get some trees that grow up. And as those trees grow, they shade the shrubs, so the shrubs are less able to grow. So you've got each generation of plants kind of working on the other to either help it grow more or prevent it from growing. And one well-studied example of primary succession that I want to talk you through is Glacier Bay in Alaska. And this is primary succession in action. It's an area where um, glaciers have been retreating fairly rapidly since the mid-1700s, and scientists have kind of been studying what happens as they, um, as they retreat. So here's basically what we got. As the glacier retreats, it takes all soil and everything with it. So you are just left with a moraine, which is basically rocky debris left over after a glacier. So what scientists kind of found is that five years or so after the glacier has retreated, we are in the pioneer stage, which is the first organisms moving in. In this stage, we see cyanobacteria, moss, and lichen. So these are going to be your first organic material in the area. You've got rocks breaking down, forming sediment. Over here, you can see that the soil depth at this point is 5 centimeters. Nitrogen content is low at 3.8 grams per square meter. Soil pH is pretty neutral at 7. And litter fall is only 1.5 grams per meter squared per year. So as that soil starts to collect, we get to the driest stage, which would be a species of plant that moves in and becomes dominant. And this is 40 years after the retreat has happened. And at this time, our soil depth has increased to 7 centimeters. You can see our nitrogen levels are up to 5. Soil pH still pretty neutral. Litter fall is starting to increase. And then we jump forward another 20 years to the alder stage. An alder is a type of tree. And in the alder stage, our soil depth is still low, but it's getting bigger. We're at 8 centimeters. You can see our soil nitrogen level have, has hopped up quite a bit, which is good because plants need nitrogen in order to grow. So without that nitrogen, you can't get further plant growth. Um, our soil pH is starting to become acidic, which is good because most plants like acidic soil. And you can see our litter fall has dramatically increased because we have got um, trees that are dropping leaves, which is good because those become mulch that help the uh, soil to form more quickly. And then final stage is a spruce stage. This is roughly 200 years after the area has been cleared. Our soil is up to 15 centimeters. Nitrogen levels are way up to 53. Our soil has become very acidic. And our litter fall is about the same, maybe a little less than it was in the alder stage. And at this stage, we've got mostly spruce 
and hemlock trees. So this is an example of primary succession at work. I hope this little tutorial gave you a little better insight into the ideas of ecological succession and disturbance. My name is Mr. Kite. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast, and we hope we'll see you again.